Thank you, Scott. Um, I will say if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's going to be screened Monday night, this coming Monday night, in conjunction with the release of the San Francisco Meth Task Force. They put together a lot of thinking people in San Francisco to deal with the meth problem, and uh, they're going to screen the film at the rollout of their, their report. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, tonight, um, and as Scott said, I talked for a few minutes about a topic, and then we can share about the topic or about whatever you'd like to share about. But tonight I wanted to talk about um, validation, healthy validation and, and unhealthy validation. And um, really a lot of this starts, we see it with addiction all the time, but I think it's really epidemic in our society as a whole, where uh, people are really getting into sources of unhealthy validation, which is um, not just a bad habit, but it's really destructive, I think, to our sense of, of self and who we are. But a lot of this starts way back when we're children, young children especially, and for whatever reason, um, we decide that uh, we uh, become hurt or become invalidated somehow, and we start to seek approval, we start to seek validation, and we start to seek affirmation from outside of ourselves. And part of the normal developmental task for any child is to really learn how to do that themselves as they mature into adulthood. But, but for whatever reason, um, a lot of people that grow up to become addicts, um, and a lot of other people as well, uh, develop this um, habit of getting their validation from elsewhere. You know, the classic case of this would be a young um, gay boy or, or LGBT youth, for example, who realizes there's something really wrong with them inside that people wouldn't be approving of. They hear from their parents talking about other people, they hear from the church, they read a newspaper, and they decide, boy, I got to keep that hidden, but how else can I get my approval? I'm going to get it by doing other things. And so we start doing um, things that, that help us get approval, like uh, being a great student, uh, achieving a lot, um, having, uh, as we grow up, the right income, or having trips and uh, that everybody you know, covets, having trophy wives or trophy husbands, uh, anything to get that affirmation and validation. And the problem with that um, is that we start to equate that with acceptance. If I get that approval, I'm accepted, I belong. And the, and the second problem with that is that we start to fear if we don't get it, there's something wrong with me. Uh, that we get, it's actually not just approval when we get it, but it's disapproval when we don't. And I think one of the reasons we're, one of the ways we're seeing this really in a classic form these days is on Facebook, with Facebook posts where people like immediately check how many likes did I get, was it shared? You know, and there's, it's kind of this contest, we're quantifying our validation, our approval. And I think people get really crushed sometimes when they don't get that kind of validation, the, the, their bang when they post something that, that they're seeking. So I think we can grow up and start to spend our whole life with approval seeking behavior, seeking uh, acceptance and validation from other words, and, and being afraid of not getting it. So I think um, this leads to becoming people pleasers, right? As adults, we, we wanna do what other people, we, what we think other people want in order to have them be pleased with us and to accept us and approve of us and make us feel good about ourselves. And the problem is that when that happens over a lifetime, uh, after a while, we don't know who we are. And we've talked on this webinar before about addicts really not knowing what they want because it's just kind of all confusing. We've spent our whole life either defending or deflecting or seeking approval from other people in, in, in uh, really unhealthy ways. And so we kind of lose track with what we feel, what we like, what we don't like. Um, and this, this can be a problem both in our lives in terms of just hobbies, but it also is a problem with our, our intimate lives to sexually. What do we like? What don't we like? What, what kind of uh, people do we want in our lives? What makes us feel good? What doesn't? It all gets kind of skewed. Um, and so there's that enmeshment that people can really uh, get overly involved with each other or the opposite can happen where they kind of reject approval from anybody and become kind of more maybe narcissistic or, or self-centered and and uh, really don't worry or say they don't worry about what other people think. Uh, so it's kind of those two extremes can develop. And so recovery and really growing up, I guess, is about learning how to self-validate, right? How to, how to get that approval and that validation from ourselves or give it to ourselves, probably is a better way to express it. So the self-validation is really accepting my own internal experience it's my wants and needs and desires and flaws. 
right? And I think the steps really, really provide a wonderful guide to, to learning how to do this because it's, it's, an, it's an examination of oneself and sort of learning how we, we can do things with our thoughts, our feelings, and it's really learning how to evaluate ourselves and do it more openly. So I made a list of kind of the gifts of this. And I, as I was reading, I think it, it's, it reads kind of like the promises <laughs> reads. Um, but but I just, these are some of the things that I think, and these are not just my thoughts, they're from elsewhere too, of, of some of the gifts of learning how to validate ourselves and not be such people pleasers. So we don't rely on others to validate our existence or define us. You know, we define ourselves. I mean, we, can, we can say who we are and live in the world and live proudly and with integrity. There's that word again, integrity. Um, we feel increasingly more connected with ourselves. One of the big prices we pay um, when we're constantly seeking elsewhere for validations, we lose touch, as I mentioned before, with what we want, what we desire, but really with our essence. We get confused, we get kind of blind, and we're operating kind of in a whirlwind. And I think it's really uh, to get clear and to get quiet. And for intensity addicts, like we treated seeking integrity with sex or porn or chem sex, being quiet sometimes is very threatening because it, it makes us, uh, it's a perfect opportunity to get in touch with ourselves and if we're not sure kind of who we are, if we don't like that feeling, it's very uncomfortable. So we, we seek to avoid it. Um, we feel increasingly more connected with ourselves. We're stronger now, so we can accept certain things about ourselves that we didn't like, that our psyche wouldn't let us like. So if I'm really in touch with myself, I can say, gee, um, you know, I have a bad habit of, of interrupting people or whatever it may be. And, and that's something that I can choose to change. I think sometimes if we're not, in touch with ourselves or if we're very well defended or for people pleasers we can't and this is not a conscious process but we can't afford the luxury of admitting that we have these flaws or blind spots and so we constantly deflect and defend against them so i think we can once we start to really connect with ourselves we can say hey this, this is something that i want to change or this is something that i'm not so proud of that i should really try to change in a way um, this is huge and this was big for me we've become less frightened by rejection you know, it's not everybody's going to love us or like us or approve of us, and that's okay. And for a lot of my years early on, that was not okay. You had to like me, or you know, it was tragic. So I think just learning how to to be okay with who I am and to know that you know somebody may not like me, somebody may not approve of me. That's okay. I may not approve of them either. But as long as I am okay with me, that's that's the bottom line here. So when we're feeling like that too, we're less likely to psychologically depend on other people. Um, we can recognize and accept our strengths and shortcomings, as I just said. We can learn to self-validate. And I think this is so important to really learn how to um, check, our, check what's going on internally and say, I like that or I don't like that and do something about it. But we don't have to constantly be kind of pushed and pulled by external forces. We can step out of our comfort zone. I think if we're in this space where we need validation from other people, we're timid in a way. We're, we're afraid to kind of take risks because someone might not approve, someone might not like it. We might get a dirty look. It might be, um, you know, I, I was really uh, buttoned up for a lot of time. And when, I, in fact, I, I went through a, a, a two year clinical internship that was pretty intensive therapy on my own part. And one of my assignments, I live in Florida, one of my assignments, and this is a therapeutic assignment, was to go to Disneyland and have a good time. <laughs> it's like lighten up. And I, I really had to learn how to kind of, you know, gee, not look awkward. You know, I'm a terrible dancer and I was so sort of like concerned about dancing. Well, dance and make a, make a fool of yourself. Who cares? You know, it's that thing to kind of just loosen up and be okay with myself. Um, when we have that awareness, we can change our behaviors. You know, we can correct false beliefs about ourselves. And then slowly let go of those old survival mechanisms that, that really brought us to this point. And finally, um, this is the most important one, finally, we can feel that we're enough. You know, just the way we are, we are enough. We don't need to have validation or extra validation or approval from anyone. You know, so I think um, for me, this, this is really important. And this was triggered by a couple of people that I saw over the course of the week that just were um, all about the job or the income or the trip or the car they drive and, and really out of touch with all the things that were really probably more important to them. So that's my little spin on, on external validation and healthy validation and um, we can take it from there. 
Um, thank you, David, so much. Um, <clears throat> just want to remind everybody this is now open for questions, and David is happy to answer whatever's going on uh, in your head that you would like to have answered. So just use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I, I, I just while we're waiting on some questions to come in, David, you know, I was at a 12-step meeting tonight, last night. Yeah, last night. And one of the guys there, um, he's been coming to the meeting for about a year and a half, waiting to get sentenced for uh, a sex offense that he committed. And um, it's, it's coming, you know, the bill is about to be paid. Um, at some point later this month and he was he led the meeting and he shared and um he he talked about how whatever happens and he's looking at some serious time um he's a happier person now and he knows that he can do his time because he finally through the work of recovery understands who he is and what his needs are mm -hmm. and what's important to him and, and, you know, he really talked about the joy of finding out who he is, um, you know, and he's in his early 30s, uh, you know, he's going to spend the rest of his 30s, you know, locked up, which stinks for him. Um, but he's got such a positive attitude about what's happening, and he's grateful to have been arrested because he was so miserable before the arrest. And now he's not, even with, you know, prison looming over his head. Um, he's no longer miserable because he's been able to find some healthy validation. He's been able to find some internal validation. And, and all of those promises that you, that you listed there are really coming through for, for, for him. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, you just, you, you nailed it. <laughs> so. Well, it's, it's amazing to see because when somebody really, and it's kind of our greatest fear, right, is to kind of let go of that external source of validation and I think a lot of us as addicts think we're going to kind of fall apart or, or I guess my worst fear is like, what's in there, right? If I let go of all this stuff outside, I didn't know what was inside. I thought there might not be anything, you know, really. So, and, and so I think to like discover that we do have this internal life and this core and, and good things and bad things and all kinds of stuff in there, once we get in touch with it, it's, it's important and very liberating. Yeah. Um, everybody, ask us some questions. Use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, it always takes you guys a little while to warm up, and then we never get to all of them at the end. So, so get them in early. Um, what are some things people can do, um, some tasks or some basic just maybe daily things they can do to help um, develop healthy validation, to help themselves find internal validation because almost all addicts let's be honest are, are externally validated um right i think um a couple of things one is to really build in some time each day for some quiet time some for reflection time and then and it doesn't have to be major amounts of time 10 minutes 15 minutes but consistently where people can sit down and just get quiet and just oftentimes i and it's not something we want to kind of release the brain from this, right? So the brain is going to try to figure this out. And if we go into it trying to figure it out, we're not, it's not going to go anywhere because the brain is going to kind of spin. But I think we can let go. I, I use a technique of just following my breath, following into rhythmic breathing, and just be quiet and sort of just try to get a sense of what's going on with me. And, and then sometimes if I'm feeling grounded, I can maybe bring an issue or bring a concern or bring a thought um, and then set an intention. I think that living with uh, intention is really an important key to this because we can sort of set the intention of who we want to be, what we're going to do, and then it may work out. But actually, the lessons often occur when it doesn't work out, when I get, kind of get pushed or pulled, and then I can see, gee, what happened there? But then the second thing, in addition to being quiet, and this sounds a little paradoxical, but to really have a few trusted people you can talk about things with because what we're doing is kind of we're doing some reality testing here. And our, our, my, my reality testing was all screwed up, frankly, when I was in, in, in disease. And so I needed people that I could trust who could give me feedback, uh, where I could say, gee, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I perceive. You know, what do you see? And, and to kind of calibrate uh, based on some feedback from the outside, the healthy feedback, not the validation, but, but real honest feedback. So I think those two things give people a great start. Thank you. Um, I was also thinking about um, 
Brene Brown, when, when you, you specifically said we can step out of our comfort zone, and part of Brene Brown's research is people who, she's specifically talking about gratitude, um, and people who are grateful are much more able to step out of their comfort zone and actually accomplish things. Um, you know, grateful just for whatever, for their life, whatever they have in their life when they're grateful. So I think that's another great tool, it's just a gratitude list. And, we, we've and talked, that's a great reality check too, is gratitude. List. Absolutely, and we talk about like gratitude every single week and it's, by just getting in touch with, with gratitude puts you in that zone, right? It, it just, it shoots you right in there where you're feeling balanced and grounded and good about yourself. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, just a reminder everybody, today's topic is healthy validation versus unhealthy validation. Um, unhealthy is uh, when we can continually seek external validation, um, you know, job, money, you know, all, all the stuff that we think we're supposed to have versus in va internal validation, which is much, much healthier for us in the long run, um, where we, we understand what our needs really are and, and, and what our reality really is. So we've got a couple questions here. Um, so let's go. Um, but, 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 seems like most of my life I have not been able to accept the validation of other. Oh, this is a twist. Um, I've not been able to accept the validation of others, even if it was there. Um, I was a musician, professional some of the time, but never really accepted emotionally people's warm words. I always felt that they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So why should I believe them? I really am not good enough. Is this typical? Where does this come from? How does it feel? Um, Great question. It's a, it's a wonderful question and just it's perfect because you really have nailed one of the complications of this is that even when we do good things and we're, you know, every one of us has gifts and talents that we, if we can kind of access and start to express, we, we can uh, do great things, um, and whether it's music or writing. But, but if we still have those old internal core beliefs um, and, that, and these are beliefs that are, I've talked about them before, they're, they're formed when we're kids, they're conclusions that we draw based on the world around us, you know, and, then, and if we grew up in a household that was dysfunctional or with an addiction or something, we, we might believe, you know, gee, I'm not safe, people can't be trusted, um, I'm not lovable, uh, I'm not lovable unless I have to really work harder for it, nothing I do is ever going to be good enough, you know, and a lot of these maybe echoes of words we heard from our caregivers. But, but in any case, we internalize that as kids. And after we grow up, we, um, we kind of don't remember that stuff so much, but it's in there. And I, talk, I describe it as software. It's like software operating in the background that, that still is affecting our, our thoughts and feelings. And when we encounter a situation like you described, and I've, done, I've had the same exact situation with my writing or with my public speaking, uh, where um, people will say, you know, I've had guys, you know, my book, um, which I'm really proud of, it's been out three years, I've traveled around the world talking about it. I literally had people come up in, in here and in other countries saying, your book changed my life, which is really kind of profound, really profound words. And it just, at first it's just sort of boom, right past me. I could not hear it. I, I mean, I heard it, but I couldn't accept it. And I, I, the meaning of it really kind of went right past me because some of those tapes were like, well, anything I do, couldn't have been an important. Somebody must have said it first. You know, I can't, I couldn't have made a difference. It's just all this chatter. So I think you you know your experience that you describe here is is just exactly perfect. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. They must you must be very wrong if you think my book is good. So yeah, it's perfect. And that really actually it's a perfect example of how these old incorrect core beliefs affect what we hear and how we can go through life with people giving us kind words and praise and saying good things. And we still feel like we're a screw up because we can't internalize it. And so I think just the first step is just to be aware of that. You articulated it beautifully. You know, that's the issue. And the, and what you need to do there is change that internal belief about yourself. And it starts by maybe taking a risk. Gee, maybe, maybe that, maybe it wasn't so bad what I just did. And that, and that you have, you know, talents and gifts that you can really accept. Um, as, as being good and valuable and worthwhile. So I think it, for me, it's, it takes practice. And I've talked to other people, I had a, a really good friend who was a pretty famous speaker in, in therapy circles and he'd speak to 400 people in an auditorium and, 
you know, people would line up and want to kiss him and get his autograph and hug him and say he was the best thing since sliced bread. And one person would come up and say, that was really the worst crap that I ever heard. And what a, what a piece of crap you are. And, and that's the person he would focus on, you know? So I think too, it's, we do it to ourselves. We, we listen to that one negative voice and it may be our own voice, uh, which we need to discard. So great, great question. Great comment. And I, and I think the corollary to that is external validation is not necessarily bad or unhealthy. It's only bad and unhealthy if we don't have any internal validation to go with it. Uh, if we have the internal validation, we can accept the external validation at face value. And right. if we don't, we'll push it away. Right. Right. Yeah. So even when we have ever all of that external validation, even for me, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, you know, I had all the bells and whistles and gifts and prizes and, you know, and I was, I thought I was a piece of crap. Um, and people would say nice things to me. And I, I just, you know, somebody actually in a therapy group pointed out my inability to accept the compliment. And it was, it was a shock to me. It was like, Oh, you're right. <laughs> um, and, and I needed to work on internal validation before I was ever able to accept the compliment. Yeah. And I still struggle. But. One of the great lessons for me was to learning how to say just thank you. Yeah. you know, just, and just and really start to believe it after a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they were told me in my therapy group. Just say thank you next time. <laughs> but, yeah. but, 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 right. I don't understand. <laughs> Right. Um, do y'all have a, do, do y'all, I love it, um, I'm from Indiana, they say y'all too. Um, do y'all have a morning root or a daily routine that gets you started for the day? Um, do you have an evening routine to wind down? What works to get your mind settled for the evening so you can get a good night's sleep? Another good question. Another great question. Thank you. And, and I'm a Midwesterner who's lived in Florida for 20 years, so I've started, y'all has started to creep into my vocabulary too. Um, so. For me, um, a morning ritual is really important and it's not long involved. Uh, if I have more time, like on Saturday or something, I may try to do longer, but for me, it's, it's uh, a little bit of reflective time, it's a little bit of meditation, um, and it's a little bit of setting the intention for the day. And I can just kind of let my mind come. I, I try to get in touch with, with my higher power and just kind of um, frame the day. And, and that's been important for me, not just to get my day going, but, and I think I've described this before, my, my professional life has me moving around a lot. And so I'm in hotels, I'm in different places. And that really, if I do that same ritual every day, no matter where I'm at, it's, it starts my day right. And I, I feel grounded and prepared. Um, and so for me, it's a little bit of quiet, a little bit of listening, and then a little bit of setting intention. Um, the end of the day for me is usually where I do my gratitude. Piece. And it's not long and involved, but I do try to consciously connect to like five, at least five things that I'm grateful for that day. And there's always many more than that. Now I'm in the flow of it. But at first it was hard sometimes to think about that. But I just, you know, so it's not, for me, it's not a huge time commitment, but it's the ritual of it and it's the consistency of it that I find really beneficial just to, to get my day off on the right foot. Um, sometimes for, this, for sleep, sleep is hard. You know, I remember. I swear, my first two years of recovery, I don't think I slept. Um, I know I did, but um, I do just a lot of try to quiet uh, breathing sometimes, just quiet meditation, just calming, relaxing kinds of stuff. Because um, night is when my mind starts to like activate. And so I have to really kind of counterbalance that. Um, so breathing helps, warm baths help, uh, tea helps, uh, avoiding the news. In the evening helps. Um, I kind of cut off news after a while, even social media, I, really any kind of stimulation, uh, including electronic, I try to cut down. So uh, and just kind of sink into the, the night. Scott, what about you? Huh? Your rituals? Um, morning is, is um, I kind of have a set routine. Um, I, I have a daily med meditation book, I read from that, and then I do uh, kind of a mashup of the third, seventh, and eleventh step prayers, um, you know, in, in English because the and thine and thou and it, that doesn't work for me. I have to use 
you and me and I and you know things like that. So I kind of rewrote them all into one prayer that I, I used. Um, and then I think you know and part of that is um, asking for help with my character defects, and I usually list something specific that I'm working on at any given time. Um, you know, acceptance is the big one right now. I'm just working on accepting life and people and situations. You know, it's they're, they're just out of my hands. Um, then I do a gratitude list, um, and I'm good to go uh, in the morning. I, you know, I have friends who, well, my morning routine, it's 90 minutes, it's 30 minutes of this, and, and I'm like, what, really? Do, do you ever get anything done? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, my t- it takes me five minutes, tops. Um, you know, if I'm wound up, um, maybe I'll try to sit quietly and just breathe for five mi- an extra five minutes. Um, but, um, and, and, um, I can use, that's my start the day routine. And it, you know, if, if my day's suddenly going crummy, I'll go back into my bedroom. I have my little quiet chair. There's no, there's no electronics in my bedroom other than lights. Um, and I'll sit in my quiet chair and I'll start my day over. I'll do that routine again. Um, the evening, I don't really have a routine. It's, um, you know, I just, I, I do go to bed at the same time every night or approximately. Um, you know, the cat sprints into the bedroom. She likes me to scrabble under the covers and she attacks, you know, from above the covers. And that goes on for about five minutes and then she goes and does her business in the litter box, um, which amuses me because most cats, when they poop, they dig a hole and they stand outside the hole and they poop in the hole and they fill the hole in. That's how cats do it. Well, she digs a hole and then she stands in the hole and then she poops outside the hole and then she fills the hole in. So, uh, so then I get up and go cover, yeah, it up, cover it up so it doesn't stink up the whole house. And 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 then we go to bed. She gets in bed and we just go to bed. Um, yeah. And uh, some nights I lay there for an hour or two before I go to sleep and some nights I don't. It just depends on whether I'm tired. I learned early on in recovery, I had a, I had a really hard time falling asleep in early recovery, uh, just like David did. I learned that nobody ever died from lack of sleep, you know, just because I'm tired, it's not the end of the world. Um, and I just force myself to get up and go to bed at the same time every day. And that is part of the routine that helps me is having that set schedule. Yeah. I want to mention, uh, just because you didn't, this amazing book, uh, which is a daily reader, uh, Sex and Point Addiction, Healing and Recovery. There's readings for every day and it's a wonderful thing. And it was uh, created by Scott right here, your co-host for the webinar. So um, look for this amazing book. And um, we post those on the Sex and Relationship with Healing website every day. So if you don't have money to buy a book, you can, you can still get a daily inspiration. Um, let's see, how do we go from believing new things intellectually to believing new things at a gut level? Hmm. Um, gee, I guess it's, in my own process, I don't know that I have a lot of wisdom to talk about that, but um, for me, it takes ideas come in as kind of these abstract concepts, and I have to really kind of look at them from different angles and play with them and, and kind of internalize it um, into more of something that's kind of belongs to me somehow. And so that, that, that just means kind of living with it, sitting with it for a while thinking about it, um, some, sometimes, you know, first impressions are wrong with an idea or a belief, and it's just kind of, for me at least, and it has to kind of just um, sink in. And I think that expression is no accident. Um, it just kind of sinks in into uh, a place out of my head. I, for me, I'm really conscious of um, my body in terms of where feelings are for me, how the physical manifestation of feelings, um, ideas, and I think just being aware of, uh, through mindfulness, just being aware of what's happening in my body with, with certain things, you know, if I'm afraid or if I'm excited or if I'm walking down the street and relaxed and just how it all feels. And for me, that there's a movement from an intellectual abstract idea into kind of, um, kind of integrating it somehow. Um, I don't know. Beyond that, I, I don't know. Scott, do you have an answer for that one? It's um, hard to say. Yeah, I like the term sink in. Uh, you know, a lot of times I think I learn things through osmosis. Um, 
you know, particularly things about myself. I learned them kind of by going to meetings, um, hanging out with people after meetings, um, particularly people with more time than I have. Um, and in Palm Springs, there's a lot of people with 35, 40, 45, you know, 50 plus years, uh, you know. And, and, and also, I, you know, if I'm struggling with something, I'll just reality check it with, you know, people who have some experience and, and, and whose opinions and thoughts I trust. And, you know, and, you know, it's like the, the hourglass, you know, it fills up eventually, but it, it fills up one grain at a time. Um, and sometimes, you know, moving it from my head to my heart, um, you know, that, that 14 inch drop or whatever it is, uh, that, that is so hard. Um, I mean, I really, really struggle with that. Um, you know, believing I was an addict, I, I really, I mean, step one was hard for me. I got it here. I just didn't get it in my heart. Um, you know, and, and, you know, any, any kind of information that's difficult for me to swallow it's the same process, but especially information about me uh, and, and my life and my behavior and my thinking. Yeah, it's really difficult. And I guess I would add for me, I, I realize thinking about it now, I have, I have to kind of break up any kind of rigid belief system or thinking system. I have to make room for other ways of looking at stuff and consider the possibility that there may be some alternatives or different ways of thinking about things and just kind of open up and not be so rigid about stuff, not be so black and white. I guess that's a useful thing for you to just, it's not either or, there's a lot of gray areas in between and just that gives me room to accept new things or think about new ideas or consider alternatives that I might have been closed to before if, if my world were so black and white, it's, it can't be this or that. Just, um, so and, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I'll go, I'll go back again to early recovery for me. I was really struggling, uh, not only with step one, but step three, you know, higher power. It was not happening for me. Uh, you know, God, not my thing. Um, and uh, my therapist at the time said, well, of course you don't believe in God. There's no room in your head for God. You're, you're so full of alcohol, drugs, and sex that you don't have room to even consider anything else. So why don't you empty all of that other crap out of your head, create some room, and maybe some new ideas will creep in, um, which they did very, very slowly over time. Great advice. Um, next question here. I have uh, an obsession with validation through diagnoses. I have been diagnosed bipolar and BPD. Bipolar was wrong, and BPD is on pause while I go through recovery. Um, I have thought I had PDS, PTSD for a while. Uh, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. My therapist says that yes, I most likely have PTSD, but I never had that piece of paper that said that I have it. Um, I feel like if it is not on paper and not diagnosed, then it is invalid for me. I deny my own experience. I am learning to validate my experience, but it's proving difficult because I still want my evaluation results to prove to myself that I do have these disorders. Um, there's a lot packed into that, um, David. Just, just have at it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's really interesting comment, and it's, you know, it's a great example of um, external validation and a kind of a medicalized version of it. And that's not that unusual, by the way. As a therapist, over the years, I've seen a lot of people who come in and, and their kind of identity was framed in terms of the disorders that they may have. And, and the reason for that, I think, is that oftentimes a therapist or a mental health provider might be one of the few people in their lives that listened, that gave feedback, that was attentive, and the connection then was um, the diagnosis. And it, so I think um, one of the central tenets, I think, of recovery, right, um, is, is about our disease and and how strongly or not we identify as the disease being all of us. You know, I, I think uh, I'm a person with addiction, I'm an addict, but that's not my entire being. Um, there's a great movement, uh, kind of an anti-stigma movement, people, persons living with HIV, you know, there are persons living with HIV, they're not, um, they're not the HIV, HIV doesn't totally define them. Just as I don't think it's, imp I think it's important not to have any diagnosis define you. So I, I would really encourage you to um, move beyond it 
for one thing, I think if you're looking and you named a bunch of pretty serious diagnoses here that, um, and I think sometimes, again, if, if I'm, if my life is kind of a, a, a whirlwind of mixed feelings and pressures and emotions and, um, and somebody can put a label on it, it kind of makes sense. I can, I can kind of cling to that um, as a way to understand what's going on with me. Um, the problem is um, oftentimes people get caught up in the, in the disease part of that and not really the recovery piece. So what I would do is, uh, you may be all of those things, you may be none of those things. And you mentioned putting one of those on hold while you're in recovery. I think one of the real tragic things that therapists can do um, is diagnose too soon, right? I, I've treated methamphetamine clients over 20 years. And if I were to diagnose uh, a mental illness for a meth client, probably in the first year, you know, it would be all the psychosis and the schizophrenic-like symptoms and, and really serious diagnoses that, that really are just effects of the addiction. So I think as long as you're in early recovery, it's really hard to diagnose any of this stuff. You really need to see how it all shakes out. But at that point, after you do get some recovery, I think it's really important to start to identify not with the diagnosis, not with what's wrong with you, but what's right about you, right? What's your strengths you have, the strengths you have to survive some of these things, the strengths you, the resilience that you may have having gone through trauma, uh, the, the insight you have as a survivor of whatever. So I think it's really important to kind of change um, your, your center of gravity away from these external kind of diagnoses into, into more your, your healthy core, your, the survivor, you know, the, the resilience. All of that. We, we do a whole lecture on resilience, of seeking integrity, and I think it's so important because a lot of us don't see ourselves that way. We don't see ourselves as resilient. We see ourselves as losers or, or as addicts or um, you know, other worse things. And I think we really need to kind of reframe how we see it. And it's gonna to have to start with you. Uh, it can't be a therapist giving that to you. You're going to have to really uh, take ownership of of your strengths and your your gifts and your talents. So I would just try to expand how you see yourself into as more than a diagnosis. Yeah, I, I think that's beautifully stated, David. Um, and you know, I do have the, the sheet of paper that says I have PTSD and a few other things, uh, including being an addict. Um, and I have learned to define myself not by that. You know, that's just not who I am. It doesn't run my day. Who I am is the person I've become in recovery. That's what runs my day. Um, and it's just a lot more positive way of looking at myself. And it comes from the inside rather than the outside, which which is what David was has been talking about. You know, the whole hour here. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Take care of yourself. That's a great, really great insight. Yeah. But. Um, can you address when someone puts their wife down to other women to get validation? Huh. It's kind of a bullying behavior there. Yeah, definitely a bullying behavior. I think, um, yeah, sometimes one of the ways people get validation is, um, and the, of course, the classically, you know, psychologically, um, a bully is feeling weak and uh, inferior and, um, afraid often and really kind of counteracts that internal distress by acting out in a way that um, really projects that onto other people and to make them feel weak and make them feel afraid um, is a, a really interesting uh, psychological defense mechanism called projection where it's just that it's like things I don't like about myself I'm going to throw onto you um, and make and point them out at you and, and, and make sure that you have, are the focus of that. And I think there's something um, about the bullying behavior where we gain something by at the expense of someone else. And um, that's just a really negative and destructive way to do it, obviously. Um, but it's, it, I think it's just that. It's uh, trying to um, appear to be a larger person um, by making someone else smaller. And it's just, uh, it's a hard, it's a mean thing to do, first of all, but it's, um, and ironically, it, it often doesn't work. In fact, I would say it, not, it never works. Um, the, it, some of the, sometimes these behaviors, they're like a sugar high, right? You know, they get, give you a little rush at first. Um, it's like my client who 
needed to pick me up. Uh, he was a, a server in a restaurant, went out and bought a $400 pair of shoes. And um, boy, he got it. They, he was hot stuff at the cash register and like in for about three minutes. But before he got to his car, he was in a panic about how he was going to pay for it. And, you know, but, but, but we do that. These are in the moment things where we want to make ourselves feel better. And, but it's short lived and it's at, at a terrible price. So I think I would just, that's one of those things I would just say stop and uh, see what's really going on there. Uh, and and, David, could there be an element of sort of relationship control? If I diminish your self-esteem, it's easier to control you. Absolutely. And this is a, a classic dynamic we see sometimes with patterns uh, in relationships and couples where there's, um, you know, controlling behavior and up to domestic violence and control where uh, you're, you're constantly being put down, you're constantly being diminished to the point and, and probably everybody knows that in, in that scenario, the person who's being diminished ultimately really kind of loses their, their efficacy, loses their power. They start to believe it. They become helpless. And there's a whole thing we could talk, I should talk about learned helplessness sometime, but um, learned helplessness is this thing where people just kind of lose their ability to kind of make decisions, know what they want. They become dependent totally on somebody else. And if you get into a power and control dynamic, that can be really dangerous and destructive and, and ultimately violent sometimes too. But yeah, absolutely. That's, that's going on there. Yeah, we have a comment about that. Um, I always ask myself if their partner is so stupid or ugly or whatever, why did they marry them in the first place? <laughs> good point. Yeah, yeah, good point indeed, indeed. Yeah, I've um, okay. got a question here. Um, is this why uh, groups, 12 Steps and other groups like this one are helpful? You hear others express things in various ways, some you identify with and some not. Um, some, someone said that porn ruins our ability for intimacy, including intimacy with our higher power God. Do you agree with this idea? So we've got two questions there. Let's take the first one. Um, why does the group setting work so well? Yeah, so in my opinion, groups are really the, the primary way we do it. Um, individual therapy is important, but the work gets done in group settings, whether it's in treatment, um, like seeing integrity or in 12-step recovery groups or in any kind of group setting, I think it's so important to um, reveal who we are in a safe setting and get feedback, get honest feedback. And sometimes the struggle of just revealing who we are in an honest way is, is a process. We don't, we're not, a, that's not how we operate in the world, right? We're, we're not walking down the street uh, in a vulnerable setting, emotionally vulnerable. So we're, we learn how to be guarded and protected, but in a group where it's safe and, and our job as the therapists and the people who designed the program is to make a safe container for that work to get done and to, make, and to keep it safe. And so, but once we have that container, um, amazing things happen, right? People reveal themselves, people get feedback, people take risks of saying, gee, this is what I really feel. And uh, and they get feedback, and, and it's often beautiful and accepting feedback. And I've seen the same thing at meetings. Um, I've seen the same thing with, with fourth and fifth steps, where people finally would take great courage. I did it myself. I was really afraid to say certain things about what I felt and, and believed uh, until I finally did, you know, raise my hand in the meeting and said it. And people come up after the meeting and said, you know, gee, I've I've had the same feeling, or I've thought the same thing, or that happened to me too, or it was just this amazing uh, feeling of acceptance, and and sometimes not. Sometimes said, you know, you're a real jerk. <laughs> okay, that's all right too. But but I think the group work, the group dynamic is incredibly important because it the group members reflect back to us what um, not only what they see in us, but what we can't see in ourselves. And it really is this beautiful feedback that that's very healing. Um, just yeah, just I over and over again the uh, examples from from seek integrity just the ones that are fresh in my mind. Just the groups are just incredibly powerful. I had the pleasure yesterday of sitting in on our alumni group. We have alumni meeting once a week on Zoom, and there were people from Australia to Hawaii to all over the place, and it was just fantastic because you could, the group just and they weren't all in treatment together, but it was a group process and it was just an incredibly inspirational meeting. So groups, groups are magic. Groups are magic. Yeah, and I 
couldn't agree more. They're, they're mirrors. Uh, you know, every people, I remember group therapy, people basically reflecting back, you know, the insanity of my addiction. You know, I would talk about it, justify it, and then I would see it reflected back in me and think, oh dear, um, I'm crazy. Um, and, and then I, you know, and we did that for each other. Um, and then as far as 12 step meetings, um, you know, I'll give you something semi-specific. I, I go to an AA meeting and we read from the book, The 12 and 12. It's the 12 steps of AA and the 12 traditions of AA. It was written by some of the founders, I don't know, about 15 years again. It was written in the 50s. And it talks about how to work the steps and what the traditions mean. And, you know, there's 24 readings in this book. And I've been going to this meeting for more than a decade. <laughs> we have been through the book a lot. Um, and every time we go through it, I think, Ugh, this one again. Um, and then we read it. And either while we're reading it out loud as a group, I will hear something that I have never heard before. And I think, oh, that's why I came tonight. I needed to hear that. Or someone will share something and it will be phrased just differently enough that even though I've heard this really practical, useful piece of information a hundred times, it never sunk in. We were talking about sinking in earlier and suddenly the light goes on and it sinks in and I think, oh, I get it now. Um, you know, why didn't I hear that the, the other hundred times we've been through this stuff? Um, so yeah, I, I really do think, um, you know, I, I had to learn uh, to listen to everybody because <laughs> I didn't want to listen to everybody. You know, some people bored me or some people were just too weird for me. But, you know, nine times out of 10, they're the person that says something that in a way that I needed to hear because they don't think like me, um, which is why I don't want to listen to them. But that's why that's why they're able to say something I, that I need to hear. So, you know, um, yeah. good observation there. Um, someone said, okay, this is, this is the other question uh, from this individual. Someone said that porn ruins our ability for intimacy, including intimacy with our higher power. Do you agree with this? I really do. Um, I think, you know, if we think, if we break down, if we can deconstruct intimacy, what, what is it? It's, it's, there's probably more elements, but the two that come to mind right now are, are being vulnerable, being open, being, uh, being exposed, being vulnerable, and trust. Um, those two are really essential components of intimacy in any relationship. And, and porn ruins those. We get really defended, we get closed off. I think we get very untrusting and, and just kind of, we lose that ability to really connect with people at an intimate level. But what does our relationship with our higher power require? It requires being vulnerable, being honest and truthful, even silently with, with our higher power and trust. Trust that, that there's some, something out there, some order at least out there, that there's some meaning, that this whole thing has some kind of purpose. And I think, um, so if we don't have those two things, it certainly affects our ability with our, with our higher power, with, at least it did with mine. Um, and, and I think uh, intimacy is probably something that, you know, we, we talk about all these addictions, the sex porn and chem sex addictions being intimacy disorders. And I think most of us, um, I've talked about this before, when I did my book on gay men, I, the subtitle was something like Reclaiming Healthy Sex and Intimacy. And I realized for a lot of addicts, it's not reclaiming because we never really had it. At least I never had it. I had to learn how to really be intimate with my partner or with uh, good friends and relationships in, in recovery because I really then, only then, learned how to be vulnerable and to trust. So um, yeah, I think that statement about interfering with our higher power is absolutely true for me. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. You know, porn, um, there's no chance of rejection, but there's also no chance of acceptance. Um, and yeah, that's just not a relationship. And if, if, you know, particularly porn addiction, where, you know, people are looking at porn for, you know, I, I, I think Patrick Carnes gave a statistic a decade or so ago, porn addicts look at porn at least 11 hours a week and often double or triple or quadruple that amount. And I know people who have walked into the room saying, I spend more time looking at porn than I spend at my job and I have a full-time job. You know, that's normal for a porn addict. Um, you know, and it's kind of what I talked about earlier uh, with the third step for me when my therapist said, 
you have no connection with the higher power because there's no room in your head for, for it. Um, you're so full of sex and drugs and, and porn and, and booze and, you know, um, and self will run riot. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, any addiction will push us away, not only from other people, but away from our higher power. Um, I, 100%. And I think that's why 12-step uh, meetings and 12-step groups uh, identify themselves as spiritual programs. You know, not religious programs, but spiritual programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want us to connect with something outside of ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how important is doing the 12 steps for the addict? Um, my spouse has done two therapy sessions and maybe four drop-in group sessions. He says he knows what he needs to do, and now he just has to do it. Hey, um, yeah, so recovery is going to take a lot more of a commitment than that. Um, you know, I'm a 12-step person. 12 steps really saved my life. I understand 12 steps aren't the only way. There's, there's other programs, but what they all have in common is a group format and a, and a way to kind of get us out of ourselves with some kind of pathway. To me, the 12 steps do that best, but, but the two, I, th I would say they're essential. Um, and if not to the 12 steps per se, something like smart recovery maybe is a way to, to get involved, but these are all programs where we are participating as a member of a group and, and some are facilitated, some are not, but, but it's really important because they're really carefully gauged, structured ways to kind of get our lives back. Um, and, and I think therapy is important. Um, you know, I'm a therapist, it's important. Um, and dropping groups are important, but you can't do a couple of sessions here and a couple of groups there and expect to get recovery. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, I think most of us that have success um, do really intensive work. And, you know, I, I went to, they say 90 meetings in 90 days, I doubled that uh, in my in early recovery because I was afraid to go home. I lived by myself and I was afraid I'd act out at home. So I just went to a whole lot of meetings. Um, but I think it, it really takes work and commitment and acceptance. And, you know, what I don't hear in your comment is yeah. um, acceptance in terms of what uh, that, that there's a problem there. You know, a couple groups, it sounds like, you know, doing something to, to placate the situation. Say, ah, uh, okay, okay, I'll do this and maybe get somebody off my back. Uh, and it's, that's just not enough. Um, it's not enough. We, it takes a real commitment to get to that acceptance, the idea of, of being powerless over this behavior, that our lives are unmanageable, um, and to really move into making a decision to give that up. Uh, this frankly sounds like kind of controlling, bargaining, uh, trying to scoop by. It reminds me of stuff I did before I got serious about recovery. So um, I'd be really cautious about that. Yeah, you know, at, at our treatment center, um, you know, guys come in for two, three, four weeks, sometimes a little longer. Um, we don't send them home cured. Uh, we don't. What we do is get them from point A to point B. And point B is where hopefully, sorry, uh, where hopefully they, we've broken through their denial, they've accepted their addiction, and, they've, and they're ready for the lifetime of recovery that's, that's ahead of them in therapy and 12-step meetings, uh, you know, individual therapy at home and 12-step meetings, sometimes just 12-step meetings. Um, but, um, and the steps are, are so important. Um, you know, we have a, a a program that we walk people through in our treatment center to get them from point A to point B. The 12, you know, 12 step programs have a program that they walk people through to get them from point A to point B. And point B is where they're well enough to help other people get from, you know, or from point B to point C, I guess. Um, and and you know, they're really kind of ingenious. I mean, the first three steps kind of, you know, I have a problem and I need help and I think I'll accept help. And then steps four through nine are, you know, here are my underlying issues, here are my character defects, I, you know, I'm gonna work on these and I'm gonna make amends to the people that I've hurt, including myself. Um, and then 10, 11, and 12 are what we call maintenance steps. You know, step 10 is sort of steps four through nine where we take an inventory of ourselves and all the way through to making amends, we do that on a daily basis. 
and 11 is a conscious contact with their higher power. And then 12 is helping other people. Um, and that's, that works. Um, and it's, it's been life changing for me. Um, I had no empathy before I started working the 12 steps, no empathy for other people. And by the time I got to step nine, I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm the asshole. I really need to do something about this. I, I need to make amends. I need to live my life differently. Um, and I need to be aware of my impact on other people. But it took the 12 steps for that to happen. Um, I mean, think about, you know, how long it takes to get into an addiction and, you know, years and years, a lifetime's worth of, of deepening the, the addiction. And so recovery doesn't have to take that long, but it ta it's a process. And it's, I think it's a, probably a multi-year process. Um, we can get sober, but, uh, you know, getting people sober is really just the beginning. Um, and then it's all about really creating a life. And that's the beauty of the steps and, and beauty of a program of recovery is that it's, it's a gift um, to bring it back to what we're talking about today, from moving to being sort of externally focused to, to living in here with integrity and, and knowing um, what we need and want and being, being there for other people. You know, if we're not, it's that old classic joke of, you know, put the, the mask on the airplane for, on yourself first before you can help somebody else. But it's really true. If, if I'm out of touch with myself and I'm uh, responding to, you know, all kinds of criticism around and trying to get you to like me and all that, I'm not going to be very much good for anybody who really needs help or needs support or, uh, or just for me to be there. Um, so it, it allows us to be present in our lives and, and, um, and it allows us to have a life. That that's meaningful and with purpose. Um, incredible gift. Um, our last question here is: Where can I get the twelve steps for him to work on? Um, I'll, I'll answer that really quickly. Um, you can Google what are the twelve steps, and they'll pop up. Um, you can Google what are the twelve steps for sex addicts; it'll pop up. Um, or go to our SeekingIntegrity.com website. Seeking Integrity, all one word. dot com. Um, I wrote a, an entire series of blogs about the 12 steps for sex addicts. There's 13 blogs. The first one is why are they important? And then there's a blog on step one, a blog on step two, uh, all the way through to step 12, talking about you know, what they are, how to work them, and what we should get from them. Um, so I encourage you to do that because that's, that's written very specifically for use by sex addicts new to recovery. Um, David, any thoughts on... on that before we wrap up. Uh, no, I think just, just what you said is, is beautiful. And if you can look at a blog, it kind of helps people interpret a little bit and understand it. So that's great. Yeah. Okay. yeah and when you go to Seeking Integrity, just um, there's a search feature, just type step one or 12 steps or, or and, and it'll bring all those up or you can type my name in, which is Scott Brassart, um, B-R-A-S-S-A-R-T. So um, Thank you, David. Today's topic for everybody was uh, healthy validation versus unhealthy validation. David, you want to wrap that up real quick before we log out? Yeah, just, you know, this movement is so important from getting stuff from the outside world to getting it from ourselves and to know that um, we, we are enough. We, we have everything we need inside if we just listen, stop and listen and, uh, and, and believe. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We had a good crowd tonight. We've been slowly getting a little bit bigger here in the last couple months, so that's great. Um, we will see everybody next week, uh, same time, same place. Great. Uh, have a good week. Thanks, everyone. Later. Good night, everybody.